fellow travelers along the path of the beam. I am known on this level of the tower as Jaime en Fuego. And if it please you, join me here for a bit of palaver on Hail to Stephen King, the 190th episode of this program that I've been doing for nearly three years now. And uh, for those who may be stumbling upon this review of a book that was not written by Stephen King, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background that over the course of nearly eight years, I took it upon myself to read everything Psy King related in published order as I was collecting all of these hardcovers that you see on this uh, Yes, this terrific tower that sits behind me. The one thing that you cannot see, which is on a hidden bottom shelf, is all of the stuff that I have purchased over the years from Cemetery Dance, which includes the Dr. Sleep Deluxe Edition, which includes the Secretary of Dreams Volumes 1 and 2, the Double Day re-releases that they have been doing, which includes uh, the upcoming Night Shift that I already have on pre-order, which includes Sleeping Beauties that I just received recently, beautiful edition there, um, the, the Double Days that have come out so far being Salem's Lot, The Shining, uh, Carrie, so they're uh, honestly, my, my go-to, I mean, full full moon, no stars, or full, full dark, I, I mean, there's really just, <laughs> there's so much amazing stuff that they have done for El Rey, the man who I so affectionately call him, uh, the, the flight or fr fright or flight, uh, I mean, there's just so much as I look down and that I know I am neglecting to mention, but I mean, and it obviously being um, the, the prize hardcover slipcase that I possess, so, um, Two years ago, in 2017, Psy King essentially had this story that he couldn't finish. It was called Gwendy's Button Box, and it was released in 2017 with the assistance in completion from, uh, I believe, the main dude behind Cemetery Dance, which is Richard Chismar. And uh, Richard Chismar has uh, done various writing, uh, you know, in his own right, and uh, also, you know, heading up C uh, CD, which I, uh, you know, shout out to Blue, who I have had. Uh, Lots of, you know, palaver back and forth with over Twitter and stuff, and he was tuned into this show various times. But um, I will admit that upon my initial read of Gwendy's Button Box, I was not particularly impressed. And um, it just, the the length felt like it sped through a lot of the story. Now, granted, it, it was a novella, and I just found myself wondering what King came up with, how much did you know, Richard come up with exclusively and finish and, and so on and so forth. And so um, I did reread Gwendy's Button Box right before uh, the publication of this sequel, which is written by Richard on his own. Uh, it's entitled Gwendy's Magic Feather. It takes place 15 years later from the uh, 70s that the initial one is written in. And so the background about the original story, if for whatever reason you're unfamiliar, Gwendy is a Heavy set girl who's getting ready to go into, uh, I, I believe, junior high, if I recall correctly, what whatever would be considered junior high. You know, she's she's finishing up middle school and she's sick of people calling her Goodyear, and so she is running up these suicide stairs in Castle Rock in the early or it's in like the mid 70s, I want to say, you know, and uh, yeah, uh, she encounters this gentleman by the name of Richard Ferris who seems. A little bit menacing, but she's intrigued by him to a degree, and Richard Ferris RF, you can guess where the connotation is there, feel free. And uh, uh, this guy proceeds to give her a small box with a series of buttons on it that all correspond with different continents across the country. Then there is also a black button and a red button. Red button is almost like a you know, think of it and will it and it can happen sort of button, as opposed to think of it, will it, it'll happen in specific country, or uh, excuse me, continents, you know, by pressing, you know, the, the colored buttons that are on top. And then on the other side, the black button is presumed in just complete destruction of the entire world. So to have that sort of power and uh, just to safeguard it, essentially, is an immense responsibility for a girl of her age. It's just absolutely crazy, but uh, there are a couple rewards for the possession of this power with these two lovers that are on each side. So one side disperses a very tiny piece of like the most exquisite candy in the shape of an animal that you can think of, and the other side produces a silver dollar uh, with uh, the year 1891 on it, and uh, 1891, of course that adds up to 19, come on guys. And that is a cool thing about it, the, the Return to Castle Rock, you know, 
uh, hearing about Sheriff Bannerman being mentioned, hearing about, you know, certain places like, you know, Castle View and just, just being in Castle Rock in the Kingverse, it was definitely cool. And I like adolescent, you know, kind of coming of age stories, but the fact that they go from, you know, the middle school to the end of her senior year in the span of, like, it's like a hundred something pages and a hundred something pages of like very large print too, um, it just moved at too quick of a pace for me to perhaps connect as much with the character as I wanted to. Upon a second reading, I did find a, a decent amount of more merit to it, but I still was not over the moon for it, and it definitely isn't a king favorite of mine. Uh, it's a it's a quaint, nice little story, but um, just the, the trope of the obsessive person messing with her, I, I thought Lisey's story, I thought, you know, misery a little bit, I, I mean, different things like that. Um, there's this guy who used to make fun of her, uh, and uh, yeah, then as she starts to transform after possessing this box and eating the chocolate and the uh, kind of, uh, I don't know, it implements discipline within her to continue with the running, to eat better. She starts to lose weight. She goes through puberty. She starts looking prettier. She becomes more popular. Um, all the athletic accolades, the grades are great. I mean, she is possessing this and the responsibility and the consequence that are paired with it, you know, for safeguarding it and for, I guess, doing a good job by doing really literally nothing aside from, you know, accumulating a bunch of those silver dollars and then in turn going and selling them because they're worth like buco bucks, especially in mint condition. We're not talking near mint or, you know, very fine or whatever. We're talking mint condition. And uh, yeah, aside from, you know, all of those perks and, you know, the money, um, there's really no consequence until she decides to actually push a particular button and in her estimation, she induces the Jonestown Massacre, chugging the Kool-Aid and all that. It's, it's a story that's obviously fascinated King a lot over the years because he's mentioned it quite a bit. It's fascinated me since I watched the TV movie in Bible class when I was in high school. Uh, Jim Jones was a sick mofo. That is faux show. And uh, so I, I don't know, maybe you would just find all of this a little more fascinating than me, but then, you know, the, the sheer consequence of the powers that she gets, I suppose, and all of the good stuff is that her best friend, Olive, uh, who she falls apart from, you know, as she becomes more popular, hurls herself off the suicide stairs and kills herself. And then that crazy guy that I mentioned who, you know, made fun of her and then starts like hitting on her and calling her sugar tits and all this other stuff when she's evading his uh, advances, that guy ends up killing her high school sweetheart, you know, who by, by the end of high school, she's going to prom with him, she loses her virginity to him, just all this stuff. So, I mean, there were great things that happened to her, but then there was also major, major consequence in Gwendy's button box. And I, I did find that paradigm of Pandora's box and the aspect of it more fascinating upon the second read. And uh, now we come to Richard writing the book himself. Um, Gwendy's magic feather... We essentially, as I said, we, we catch up 15 years later. So um, uh, 1984, I believe, is when, uh, you know, because it's 1999 in this. So yeah, 84 was where she was, you know, graduating college and, you know, all that other stuff. And uh, uh, we get some background as to what has happened to her. And that's probably my favorite bit of this book is just finding out what more awesomeness Gwendy went on to even without possessing the book. It does imply for that reason that there was like a residual magic, so to speak, hence the, hence the title that she continued to possess because she goes on to be a popular novelist. And while her first book doesn't do so good, her second and third novels especially really click. They're on the bestsellers list. Um, then in turn, she befriends this gay man who becomes like her older brother and unfortunately dies of AIDS and she decides to take up a crusade upon herself to tell his story. So she goes from uh, writing more fiction to pissing off her, uh, her literary agent and saying, no, I'm gonna write this like auto, this like biography of sorts, obviously not autobiography, uh, this bio about my friend, my friend Jonathan. And uh, yeah, it uh, doesn't succeed, but she decides to also make a corresponding documentary film about it. And that's where, 
more success for Gwendy, obviously. Uh, she wins Academy Award for Best Documentary for that sheer fact. And so the, the greatness continues despite the sadness, you know? So I guess that is a continuation of the consequence with the success. So that is at least good. And uh, then she decides to get into politics. And she in turn becomes one of the youngest congresswomen ever elected. And she's, you know, she is a uh, she, she's a Democrat, and I know that, uh, that I, I'm, I'm a registered independent, so, and that's more so because of the fact that politics don't really captivate me, and I've had a lot of, uh, as an entertainment journalist for many years now with the horror show, stretching back to print all the way in 2009 when I was writing for, you know, Playtime and doing some online work for Examiner, and, you know, uh, basically writing about all kinds of different things in the entertainment realm, in the dining realm, in the sports realm, but... Politics and especially social issues have never been my cup of tea. It's it's just tough stuff, honestly. And um, being the fact that she is a congresswoman, you can kind of you can kind of see that this is going to be a fairly political book, and, um, and 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 it is at times. And so that's something that I just didn't find as intriguing, unfortunately. This is an alternate universe because the man who was president in 1999. It's not Bill Clinton, and there's even, uh, it's obviously a different level of the tower, uh, which is cool. You know, I, I did dig that aspect. I thought that was uh, a nice little touch because there is a mention uh, by Gwendy internalizing at one particular point that I can't believe this guy beat Clinton. And so you, you uh, kind of guess that this guy has been in office. He's finishing up his second term at this point. And in this alternate, the alternate twinny verse of sorts, um, there is... A guy who is very Trump-like in power, and he is also feuding with North Korea. So all of that mirroring, like what's going on right now, I just found it slightly off-putting. Not that I like our current president at all, but I just it felt forced and out of place. And once again, I know Steve and you know uh, his personal politics, and so I would presume he approved. And and Steve does implement a lot of his personal politics in his stuff, and. For me, it doesn't always work as much as I love El Rey, so, so that's another thing. But yeah, so she's a congresswoman, and she does not like the president that she works along with in Washington. Uh, she is married, and her husband is a photographer. Um, he's done stuff with Time Magazine, so he is very prestigious, but he's always like overseas and photographing crazy situations of war and peril, and so they you, ex you understand the extent of their deep love but they're always away and you can tell it's a strain on, on Gwendy because she misses her husband. And so she's going back to Castle Rock for the holidays and that's essentially where the story really starts after we get brought to, up to speed about what has happened with Gwendy in the 15 years since we have seen her. And that's really where the, st the story just kind of loses me. Um, I, I will give Richard a lot of credit for the fact that he is an eloquent writer his stuff flows very well. The language is, it's, it, it feels very natural, but it's also very descriptive. Much like Steve, he has this knack for using interesting examples to describe character traits of certain people in Castle Rock, certain situations and stuff. And so that is cool, but the familiarity of the narrative is where I have my biggest gripes about this. And so, in a lot of ways, with him being the first allowed to ever play around in Castle Rock on paper, this to me had the same sort of um, just lack of satisfaction I got from the Castle Rock television show, where there was interesting ideas and there was, you know, cool Easter eggs and familiarities. I mean, there's tons of Easter eggs in here. There's obviously mentions, there's mentions of Frank Dodd. There's mentions of Cujo. There's, uh, you know, mentions of the town burning down in 91. I mean, Norris Ridgwick is the sheriff now. So, I mean, this is all, the, you know, Pangborn's mentioned. I mean, for big CRs like myself, there's tons of cool little nods and winks. But that's not enough for me to love something and... I don't know. I, I won't go as far as saying it's like the extent of a cover band, but in some ways I kind of feel like that is a good example. I feel like it's a harsh term. I've seen some really damn good cover bands, you know? Astro Creep 2000 was one of the first shows I ever went to as a kid when I was like 15. 
and they were the world's greatest white zombie slash Rob Zombie cover band. And they were really, really good. And, you know, that, and, and that's the thing, though. I mean, if a song is being covered, a lot of the time I appreciate it the most when it tries to do something drastically different than the original song, as opposed to, I mean, wouldn't I just prefer listening to the original song if you're not really bringing a lot of new stuff to the table? And so uh, there's, there's uh, some nastiness afoot in Castle Rock. Surprise, surprise. There are a couple girls who have been presumably kidnapped, but, you know, really they've gone missing. Nobody knows that they're alive or just being held captive or what the hell has gone on. But being Castle Rock, you can imagine people are assuming the worst. And, you know, with Gwendy being back in town and also with her affiliation, you know, with, with Congress and everything, there is definitely a desire for this representative of theirs to, you know, really assist with the search and the process and do a little bit more. But in the same right, she is also juggling the strain of the fact that her mother is recovering from cancer and chemo and regaining her strength and seemingly doing better. So she's got those two things that are just kind of pulling upon her. And yet her mother is doing a lot better. And so that's a reassurance. But there is definitely the scrutiny that she's under from certain citizens in Castle Rock. But then also the fact that, you know, with her prestige, with her, you know, the small town girl does good and all that other stuff. She's just, she's got people harping on her and everybody wanting to talk to her and ask her to like speak at events and stuff like that. But the one thing that I must say is that even though I once again was not particularly fond of this book, just like I wasn't particularly fond of the previous one, I definitely am fond of Gwendy. Even if I didn't care for the story very much, I really love Gwendy as a character and I appreciate just her belief in, in magic and the really the magic that can be created by doing the right thing and by being compassionate and by really genuinely caring for people, showing empathy, sympathy, these really crucial character traits that are often lost, especially in bigger cities, I would imagine, like DC, where the average politician is so about themselves and their own very narrow-minded, selfish goals that as opposed to really thinking of what's good, especially for, you know, the lower class and stuff like that, they are very concerned with their own agenda, more so than anything else, their own separate sector of people, as opposed to the grand scheme of everyone. So I do really like Gwendy as a character. Um, I have yet to really look at my notes, obviously. Um, I know that King, obviously, with the Castle Rock show, and even with, I, I did a series on here called Films That Forgot the Face of Their Father. And it was me basically covering all of the King sequels that were not based on anything that he wrote. And I reviewed all of them. I reviewed Pet Cemetery too. I reviewed uh, Sometimes They Come Back Again and Sometimes They Come Back For More. I reviewed uh, A Return to Salem's Lot. And, you know, so I, I did reviews of all of these and it's funny because I found, I found more merit in them and more enjoyment in some cases, especially Pet Cemetery 2 and uh, Larry Cohen's Return to Salem's Lot, which is just so bonkers and weird and so, so Larry that I actually, when I hated it as a, as a younger fan of the original Salem's Lot, I actually appreciated it for its strange weirdness and I really like Michael Moriarty. So I read this book twice in the last couple days since it came out on the 19th. Obviously, it comes out on uh, the 19th of November. Very, very, very sharp, Mr. Chismar. Um, so I read it in its entirety in a couple hours, honestly. And then I also listened to the audiobook, which is read by the same uh, same uh, woman who did the, the first one. And she, she reads it very well. She has kind of a tenderness to her, which really brings out the, the Gwendy character very well. Um, and... Uh, I found more to, I, I, I think that you definitely have to, when it's, a, when, when it's a work that you really want to properly analyze and being a King work, a Castle Rock book, I, I needed to give it two spins just to really make sure that I wrapped my head around it properly, I guess. And there are some people in um, my Hail to Stephen King Facebook group that I do that were like, well, it's really banking on the King name, you know, uh, the sequel to Gwendy's Button Box co-written with Stephen King, foreword by Stephen King. The fact that his name is mentioned twice on the cover, um, and then there's also a quote from him on the back where he gives some very not, very kind praise to, to, to Richard. And I know that there, 
they're more than just, you know, colleagues who have worked together, they're, they're friends. And so if there's anybody that you would entrust your universe to, it would be a friend. And uh, so I, I don't, I don't doubt the genuineness of that, but I, I wasn't the biggest fan of the Castle Rock show, as I mentioned, and, uh, but yet there's also been the Dark Tower license, which has been given to, you know, Marvel Comics, and I know that was recently renegotiated, but I really enjoyed all of the Marvel Comics, although those were also more so adaptations that kind of expanded on things as opposed to a completely new story, which is what this was and which is what Castle Rock was without any involvement from, from Psy King himself. And I, um, I feel like, without spoiling much, I feel like the essence of consequence, while you get it early with the death of her friend Jonathan, later in the book, when uh, because Gwendy gets the box again, it mysteriously appears in her office in DC. And that's, she initially doesn't want to touch it, you know, but she eventually gives in and she has like a little piece of the chocolate and then she goes for her second run and Another gripe of mine was that there was just a lot of rehashing of things that had already happened in the first book, like flashback status, like recollections of the guy who, you know, killed her uh, her high school boyfriend. But, I, I mean, I guess these things would make sense, and especially if the box reappears, it's going to start awakening those skeletons in the closet, reminding you of those old demons. So, I can rationalize it, but I still felt like there was too much attention paid to it, and... The consequence isn't there as I anticipated that it would be in the back half of the book. In fact, Wendy actually starts to develop some powers that were just, for me, far too familiar to uh, other Psy King books, uh, most notably The Dead Zone, another Castle Rock book, which, with what happens with trying to locate these killers, it was way, way too Dead Zone rehash for me. and. Um, I know lots of characters in King books have had this have had this touch, so to speak, you know. But I it just it felt too familiar. It it really really did. Um, but then I I don't know. I I liked just the the whimsy and the good hearted nature. Uh, the actual explanation of Magic Feather. That didn't really go so well for me, this kid that she that she gets it from. But it does go in line with the character of the fact that Gwendy has always believed in magic. She's always believed in just the power to do extraordinary things that people wouldn't necessarily believe are possible. And so as I've as I've ruminated about it more, including sitting here and just discussing this book and trying to review it from not just a CR standpoint, but from an objective journalism standpoint and not trash it because there was definitely a part of me that wanted to beat this book up because of the fact that once again, it moves at too brisk of a pace, especially with certain beats where you're supposed to be in doubt for you to really ever be in doubt. And I think more so than anything, it's, it's the way the book is structured in the fact that there's chapters that are like, a page, like, you know, a paragraph, a page and a half, and that really, with the exception of two very lengthy chapters near the end of the book, like right near the end in the third act, everything else is just, it's these little blibs, these little blibs, and that sort of, it's a very deliberate style, and it's the same style that we had in Button Box, but I, I just don't particularly care for it, and yet, I've talked to a lot of other people who did, so I'm not here to, you know, talk crap or anything just because it's not my cup of tea. Uh, the one thing that I all too often say is that art is subjective and interpretive and, you know, uh, one man's trash is another man's treasure. That's probably too negative of a way to put it, but I mean, it's just, I have seen certain films that like, for instance, I love the movie The Witch and uh, here on the horror show, everybody else on the horror show hates that movie. Um, and yet, we go to see The Lighthouse, the second film from director Robert Eggers, and I thought it was just okay, and my co-host who hated The Witch actually thought that it was significantly better than The Witch. So that's, I mean, that's just one example, obviously, but it's just me trying to say that it, I'm not trying to influence you to hate on this book or anything of that nature. I honestly want viewers to read it and give me their opinions in the comments below. But, I mean, for me, I felt like the constant callbacks were kind of boring. Um, 
I thought it was just a little too sappily sentimental. Um, but, you know, that's that's the Gwendy character. So, you know, I, I like sentimental King, you know, stories and stuff. And I don't know. Um, eh, it's just, it, it is what it is. But once again, um, it's worded very well. And I, I definitely am very curious to read The Long December now because I feel like maybe in just shorter form stories, I can really just, because once again, this goes through a lot very quickly. It doesn't go through years and years and years. It just goes through a holiday season, you know, years and years being, you know, Gwendy's story. But I'm very curious to ch check out Long December and just totally original ideas from Richard as opposed to him playing in King's Playground. I'm just very, very curious about that, and I'm, I'm definitely going to purchase a copy of that because I, I'm really just, I, I have a fascination to get a better sense of his style because I feel like he really has skill as a writer, um, especially with dialogue and with description. It's just the story for me here was what just didn't, didn't work as well. Um, I'm just trying to make sure that... Um, yeah, and, and, and I hit pretty much everything. And also the the name that this killer gets, the, it's it's very Thomas Harris, and that was another thing that kind of bothered me a little bit. But, you know, bottom line, it's, um, it's worth checking out if you're a fan of Castle Rock, if you are a constant reader, if you are a longtime constant reader especially and have checked out everything that's taken place in Castle Rock, if you like the Castle Rock television show where it's doing it's doing very much the same thing playing in the playground playing in someone else's playground essentially making your own sandcastle there um at a park that maybe you don't frequent that lots of other people do i don't know i can i, I can make these poor analogies till i'm blue in the face but lastly the the reappearance of uh mr richard ferris here led me to believe that it might it, it might not be who i thought it was you know i didn't outright spell out who I thought it was. I, I, I gave a hint here, obviously. But the character seemed quite different in this in comparison with in Button Box. And I didn't like that. I didn't like that. But, um, you know, once, once again, to each their own. And uh, that's my thoughts on Gwendy's Magic Feather. It is available in uh, audio form on Audible. Uh, you can listen to it on Scribd if you're a member of that audiobook streaming service that I'm also a big fan of. I'm, I'm a member of both. You know, so uh, I don't know. I still feel like as a completist collector, I want to I want to order that special edition with the additional little king goodie. And then I, I didn't hate this. I didn't hate it. But I definitely, as you guys can tell, had some severely mixed feelings about it. And um, but major, major respect to Mr. Chismar and to the great work that he does with, you know, besides all of those king books that I mentioned, you know, just the featuring of so many other smaller authors that he obviously, authors and artists, because they do a lot of terrific illustrated editions of things. And I mean, it's really, really important to buy physical media, in my opinion. I had actually ordered this from Amazon and I pre-ordered it and I thought I was getting it like right around. And then, yeah, they're like, oh, you know, it's been delayed. We're not going to be able to get it to you until it was like, it's like closer to Thanksgiving. And I was like, no, no, no cancel the order and I went down to Barnes and Noble and I actually bought it. I wish I had just given my money directly to Cemetery Dance in all honesty, which is probably what I will do for that deluxe edition, which is uh, $75, has some additional illustrations and cool stuff. And uh, I will probably give this to uh, a fellow Steve King friend and uh, just see what they think of it. So I will pass that love along and uh, yeah, so I have been Jaime in Fuego. Y'all can find me on all social media sectors like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and here on YouTube for my own channel called In Fuego Tainment, where I just put up a review of Knives Out, which is one of the best movies of the year. Some of my other favorites of the year are reviewed there as well, including Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Wild Rose, even Good Boys. I mean, I've also been doing a bunch of Star Wars coverage leading up to the release of The Rise of Skywalker next month. 
comics, novels, retro reviews of the films, I mean, some of the television animated stuff, I mean, yeah, it's been a fun journey. You can probably tell that's why I'm rocking my, my dark side shirt here. But uh, if you're here for the spectacular coverage, yes, I know, I know, you definitely uh, need to like, share, subscribe this video. And uh, yes, uh, give some love to uh, us and our 30,000 strong subscribers. And uh, yeah, once again, I've been doing this show for nearly 200 episodes now. And I'm uh, switching to two episodes a month for December, just so I can get to the 200th episode before the end of the year. It's gonna be something very big and special. And I couldn't have got this far without all of the love, compassion, support, and uh, I am humbled and honored by just all the people, all the amazing CRs, and even you know, new to Stephen King, or people who have only read Stephen, or, uh, who have only just watched Stephen King on like the screen, you know, whether TV and film and stuff like that. I'm further, I'm furtherly, forever <laughs> indebted uh, to all of you for just being so kind and so cool and so supportive throughout all of these episodes and all of the topics and all of the rereads. And speaking of rereads, Book of the Month for November is Revival for its five-year anniversary. Next Saturday's episode will be live discussing Revival spoilerific, so make sure to tune into that. Time to be announced. And uh, lastly, Every Monday evening on the Willis Scredia YouTube channel, I am uh, glad to be part, humbled and honored there too, of a program called Show Business. Hashtag Show Business. And uh, yes, that is where every Monday from 9 p.m. Uh, excuse me, 9 p.m. Eastern and 6 p.m. Pacific, we have discussion about uh, well weekend box office numbers. We look ahead and make predictions to the upcoming weekend. And lastly, have a bit of palaver about all the biggest stories in movies that have come out over the course of the previous week. So I have been Jaime Fuego. Y'all have been amazing. Say thank you. And until the wheel of Ka comes around once more, I shall say hasta luego, sin amigos, and constant readers and viewers alike. But I am hopeful that we get to share more of this palaver sooner rather than later. And until then, remember to stay scared and read Stephen King. And definitely, Give Gwendy's magic feather a chance. Everyone knows it's Gwendy.